technology. technology. We live in probably one of the most privileged times ever. I mean, I can literally clap my hands or snap my fingers. And just like that, I played two different sound effects that people back then would have probably lost their wallet for that, honestly. <laughs> I don't know, I just, it's just such an interesting time how we live in such a world where everyone is capable of doing anything versus back then where everything that I'm doing right now or everything that I am capable of doing right now would have costed me my whole wallet, would have costed me millions, would have costed me my house. Would have costed me my family. And that is where me, my shiny hair, and my ugly face, I'm gonna be explaining, obviously, not just implementing the sound effects, but also how editing from back then to now has changed over the course of this godforsaken history. So sit back, relax, get your popcorn, even though you're probably in class watching this so you don't have popcorn, why are you eating popcorn in your class? Get that out of my face and let me tell you everything. Editing sound has transformed to such a degree back then to how it is now. I mean, at least in our time, we are able to pretty much record anything and use whatever $15 software we want to to edit whatever we felt like editing onto. But back then, silent films were as they are, silent. The only reason why they weren't silent is because they had to actually play live orchestra when said film was being played. But how did we get to this point where we can be able to do magic like this? Well, to start things off, in 1859, there was this thing called the phonautograph, a device created by, if I can even say this correctly, Edward Leon Scott, who was a Frenchman. This wonderful masterpiece of a phonautograph, if I'm even saying this correctly, was the very first device that was able to actually record and play back sound. It is also the same device that had this legendary classic of a sound. It wasn't until 1877 where a man named Thomas A. Edison invented the phonograph, a device that could record and play back sound on a wax cylinder, which is different from the phonograph. However, for a solid few years, film and sound have been separate for a very, very long time. They didn't really have the proper technology or devices to pick up enough sound for a large crowd to be able to hear. Eventually, there was the kinetoscope, which combined film and sound, however, it could only be viewed by one individual. It was a small box that had one singular peeping hole with a very small short clip that had the combination of music and maybe even occasionally some sound effects. However, it wasn't enough. It wasn't until the funny mustache man, Lee DeForest, the same man who made the Audion tube, which amplified small signals used for radio and distant calls, turned his genius towards motion pictures. With the help of him and another man named Theodore Case, they actually succeeded. This is a demonstration of a talking picture. No How was it done? Well, to make it simple, D Force and Theodore Case used a device that would pick up sound using the most magical thing in the world. <gasps> LIGHT BABY! A light bulb, very sensitive, would start emulating when sound was picked up. To then, it would imprint the sound as a level of brightness on the film reels, kind of like to the side of the film reels in a bit, pretty much creating a sense of a barcode in a way. This was the only way sound was implemented for a very long time. Nonetheless, it was still a massive success. How much of a success? Successful enough to produce over 800 plus movies a year from 1920 to 1930, which was, you know, a lot. Well, to be fair, it actually took a while for the device to be accepted into the big name studios like Hollywood, but was accepted by a whole other studio, but Warner Bros was a champion about it, but that's a whole nother can of worms to talk about. Anyway, brightness barcodes was the only way to add sound to films and bring them to life, versus now where I could just put this over here and, you know, it'll play in an explosion sound again. Just like that, in the spam of less than a decade, Film with sound have finally became the norm. Eventually, during the television era, which was like 1950, stereo sound was finally introduced. It was used in only a handful of movies, however, for good reason. Theaters had multiple channels of audio ingrained into the film or into the theater. 
but it wasn't until 1976 when the Dolby Stereo utilized a few of the channels as its own strip of barcode. Thanks to that, Star Wars Episode IV, A New Hope, which was released in 1977, would win the Academy Award for Best Sound Effects. Over time, audio technology would improve, with the release of THX, Dolby SR, and Dolby Digital. However, they still had to edit all of their audio onto the reels, but they had the technology to make their job only a little bit easier though. Editors had two different types of canisters, one for the video and the other for the audio. They would then line them up in a machine that would play back the film section manually. They would then mark down sections of both reels as a way of reminding which parts to sync. Ever wonder why you see the strange marks when watching the behind the scenes? That's why. Whenever things lined up correctly, they cut out all the bad bits, which was their way of using this pretty cool razor tool I have here. Once they finished the syncing and the snipping, they then put it in another machine that would properly play back the film. This was pretty much the norm that they had to stick with for a very, very long time. It admittedly must have been a time-consuming, tedious, and probably unfun thing to do back then, but soon, we eventually got computers. And with computers, came this thing called computer animations. Which then came Toy Story. How did they edit their stuff back then? Well, unfortunately, I don't actually have many answers myself. With the amount of research I was able to do, I actually could not find many results myself, but the one thing I was able to find that I'm assuming is what they used back then, and what they use probably now, is an animation software they made called Presto, and then made another animation software specifically for rendering their animations called RenderMan. But alas, how they actually were able to do their things is still remains a mystery, at least to my knowledge. But they probably did have Premiere Pro since it came out in 1991, so you know there's there's a chance that that was a thing, right? Yeah.